The reading is from Job, the 38th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy, or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no further. And here shall your proud waves be stopped. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we don't uh, often get a reading from the book of Job, so it's kind of interesting. But we are in the uh, third week of a five-part uh, series on uh, discernment and what that means for us uh, individually as people as well as a congregation going forward and what God is calling and asking us to do. And uh, there are lots of things that go into the, the whole piece of discernment, but at some level, discernment is a decision-making process. And uh, there will be some decision that will be arrived at uh, in the course of discerning what God is asking you to do or what God is asking us as a congregation to do or how we're to, to be. And, and this is interesting then to talk about Job as a way to, to understand that although there is a decision coming, um, we, we can be assured that God is going to be with us regardless of how the decision goes. And, and what, I, what I want to say is this. The story of Job uh, has been around for a long time in our uh, Hebrew tradition. Um, it's, uh, it's remarkably, it's the hardest book actually in the whole, old, uh, whole Bible actually to translate. It's got words in it that don't exist in most places. Um, and so this book has always stood as a, as a wonderful story about this guy named Job. Now Job uh, is just, the, according to the, the beginning of the story, Job is, is a wonderful guy, loves God, loves uh, everything about him, seems to be going really well. And uh, there is a Satan. Now a Satan in the, in the, in the Near Eastern traditions of which uh, this story arises is, is somebody who just kind of wanders around and tries to stir up trouble. They're not necessarily evil or anything like that. They just want to make sure you really think about what you think about or do what you really do. And uh, so th- th- this Satan goes up to God and says, hey, I know you got this, this guy Job that's really good, but I bet you I can get him. I bet you I can get him to, to curse you. God's like, no, that's not going to happen, not with Job. You know, I got some other people, you know. Scott Fredrickson, he'll do it in a heartbeat, but Job, no way, you know. And uh, so Tom says, ah, I bet you I can do it. So first chapter or so, uh, Job loses all his livestock and all his wealth. Uh, still loves God, though, well, you know. And uh, then uh, Job loses his kids and his family and yep, still loves God, loses his wife, still loves God, loses everything, sits in a pile of ashes in the middle of the street and, and refuses to give up on God even though he has now lost everything. And uh, so now then Job, some of Job's friends come to him now and uh, they say to him, hey Job, come on, just, just, you know, just say God God's responsible for all this bad stuff happening to you and that God doesn't love you. Come on, you can do it. And Job's like, no, I'm not going to blame God. I'm not going to blame God. And so this goes on for 37 chapters. All right? The friend comes and says this. He says, no, whatever. Finally, right around chapter 37, you know, Job is thinking about it. He's like, well, maybe, maybe. 
Uh, and then all of a sudden, in chapter 38, you get these verses that Mike just read for us. And the Lord answers Job out of the hurricane, out of the whirlwind. Who are you, buddy, to question me? Were you around when the world was created? Were you around when I set the line for when the sun was going to rise? So tell me. And this goes on for four chapters of God out of the whirlwind asking Job, so really, you know what's going on. And at the end of these four chapters of God questioning Job, putting Job in Job's place, Job says, you're right. You are the God and I am the human. And through the process of this, the Satan loses the bet and Job gets his uh, wife restored, gets his children restored, gets um, his wealth restored. Story ends. Now, what's important to realize when you're in the process of discernment is that you are going to make a decision. And if you make a decision that is what God wants you to do, what God is calling you to be, what God is calling us to, to do is in ministry here at First Lutheran or, or in your own life, if you make the decision that's, that, that, that's parallel with that, well, that, good for you. I mean, you did a you know, you did good job. Excellent. But what if you make the wrong choice? This is the question. What if in the process of this discernment, that you're thinking about what we should be doing or what you should be doing, and you, and you come up with a really good idea, at least seems like a good idea to you, and, and you put it out there, you throw it out on Facebook, do a little Facebook poll. How many people think I should jump off a cliff? Uh, yes or no? Maybe, possibly, only on Thursday. I don't know. You, know, you, you create a poll for yourself. And, and you've, you've, you've kind of done your best work, and then as you go into it and you start living into that reality that, that you've discerned God's calling you to be, what if it, it, is, it, it gets clear that you didn't make the right choice? Hey, this is where it gets a little sticky, because now all of a sudden you were really excited to have the opportunity to be able to discern what God's asking you to do, and you thought you did a really good job, and, and now it's, it's pretty clear that you missed something. Does this mean now that God's like, well, you tried, good job. And, and the story of Job. The story of Job gives us courage that in the midst of our discernment, should we happen to not get it exactly right, should we miss something, should we not somehow listen to the voices of God and what God is asking us to do, that if we should somehow find ourselves misguided or off step, that God is not a retributive God. In other words, God is not a punishing God. God is not a God of vengeance and revenge, hatred and punishment. God is a God of grace and love and mercy. So that, for example, using the story of Job, when Job even gets to the point of thinking that maybe God doesn't love him anymore, that's precisely where God comes out of the whirlwind and says, Job, Job, look at the bigger picture here. You are loved and cherished by me in spite of all the bad things that have happened to you in spite of all the things that have somehow cursed your life over the last, you know, whatever it's been, two, three weeks, it doesn't really give a timeline. You are still mine, and I will still find a way to protect you. And when Job finally sees that God is a God of grace and love, God is a God that works out of mercy and compassion, he's able to then see the reality of the world as it is. That what we are about as people is not trying to find ourselves on top of the heap, but to understand that we live together under a God who will continually bless us no matter how dark the days get. No matter how much rain is sent, we will be loved. And that, of course, is sometimes easy to believe when you're having a family reunion. My wife's at a, at, a, at a reunion with all her sisters, and it's a great weekend for her. It's easy to believe God loves you at times like that. It's easy to believe that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing when everybody's together and celebrating. I mean, the Ohio State Buckeyes even won. It was like the perfect trifecta for her. So, you know, I mean, that's easy. But it's when you're, you know, your best friend calls up on the phone and says, hey, the doctor just told me I got cancer and six months to live. That's when it gets hard. 
That's when it gets hard, when the spouse of 45 years of your life is no longer with you. That's when it gets hard. It gets hard when a child that you've raised and nurtured your entire life passes away from a disease you had no control over. That's when life gets hard. And the glory and grace of our God is that God doesn't give up on us when those difficult times happen. That rather God enters into the suffering and the uncomfortableness that we are in and walks with us. When God entered into the whirlwind with Job, God went right to the street where Job was sitting in his pile of ashes. He didn't ask Job to clean up and prepare himself, but rather entered into the very world that had become the ashes of Job's life. And you and I, who live from Jesus Christ, precisely cling to that promise. That promise of being able to live even in spite of the wrong choices we make, the decisions we didn't quite get right, the discernments we didn't take the time to properly discern. Because the the promise of God is that in that cross on which Jesus died, our life lives even beyond our mortality. None of us get out of this game called life alive. But we do get out of it, for those who believe in Jesus Christ, a life with God, even beyond our death. So therefore, when we're looking at discerning, One of the things to remember is to not worry about whether you're going to make the right choice or not. To not continually put off making an actual decision and moving forward because you're worried about getting it wrong. But rather, to take the time to be able to properly listen to what God is asking you to do, whether it comes in the silence like Elijah, comes in a bush like Moses, or even a whirlwind like Job. To go on Facebook or to talk to your family and friends and say, what are we? called to do? Who am I called to be? What is the purpose of my life? When I turned 22 years old on my birthday, we didn't have cell phones back then, I got a phone call from my dad. Now my dad died about four and a half years ago, no longer with us. But he called and he said, happy birthday. And I said, hey, thanks, happy birthday, thanks. And uh, he said, uh, coming home in a couple days. I was coming home for Christmas that year. So um, I said, yeah, I'll be home. He says, you know, it's weird. I said, what's weird, Dad? He said, I don't have anything to do. But I was like, well, Dad, I've known you for 22 years. I've never seen you actually do anything. Why does this change? I mean, he said, no, no. He says, you know, he says, like, there's nothing left to being a father. I mean, your brother and you are out. He says, you know, I'm just writing you a check every now and then. It's really kind of boring. And I said, well, Dad, there's still a lot to go. I said, uh, as you know, my brother, I mean, well, he's this close to an idiot. You're going to have a lot of training left to do for him. And there's me. I'm even farther down the scale than him. He's the good son. I mean, what happens? I'm young. I could get married. I could have kids. My dad laughs. He says, yeah, you married and kids. God wouldn't do that to you. You know, not everybody's right. Do you ever feel like that? That, you know, you, you accomplished some things and you did some stuff and now you're looking at what to do next and... It doesn't seem like much more than just writing a check. It's about all you got left to do. That's precisely why discernment is so valuable. Because God was obviously not done with my dad. You can ask my kids. He's the best grandparent there ever was. He had a lot still to offer in the next 30 years of his life. And he did. But we all get to that point where we think to ourselves, we've, we've done it. We've crossed off everything off the list. We, you know, we had our list. We checked it off. The boxes are marked. But God's not done with you. And you might be tired. 
You might be in the midst of a bad streak where everything like Job seems to be going right off the list and you're just one, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty soon you're just sitting in the middle of your living room in a pile of ashes. But God's not done then either. And should it happen in a worst case scenario that you are no longer with us, that you no longer are able to attend a worship service here because the last one you were at, you were in a box. God will be with you then too. With those ashes, scattered in an ocean, buried in a grave, God will enter into that place and be with you there. Because the promise of our God is not only to be around us when we get it right, but to be with us if we get it wrong. Job knew it. May we learn it too.